Joe Biden is due to speak to Vladimir Putin by phone today as Washington fears a Russian invasion of Ukraine could begin any day now. Police in Paris are trying to stop hundreds of vehicles blocking the streets as a so-called freedom convoy descends on the city. Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin hold a phone conversation this Saturday amid tensions growing on the Ukrainian border. The U.S. believes Russia could carry out an invasion of Ukraine any day now. U.S. officials have advised their citizens to flee the country and are also set to evacuate their embassy in Kiev. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible and in any event in the next 24 to 48 hours. If you stay, you are assuming risk with no guarantee that there will be any other opportunity to leave and there no prospect of a U.S. military evacuation in the event of a Russian invasion. Washington has ruled out any direct military intervention in Ukraine but will deploy 3,000 additional soldiers in Poland and shift 1,000 more to Romania as both countries have a border with Ukraine. The U.S. says Russia has deployed enough air, sea and ground power to sustain a war in the next few days and could start with aerial bombing. Moscow has recently started massive military drills with neighboring Belarus, but it insists they will finish next weekend and are not preparing for war. According to the Russian defense minister, the deterioration of the situation is not attributable to Moscow, which insists on its main demand that Ukraine should never join NATO and that the Atlantic Alliance should withdraw its forces already deployed in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Police around Paris have struggled to prevent hundreds of vehicles reaching the city centre as part of a protest against France's COVID-19 regulations. The rally was inspired by the so-called Freedom Convoy in Canada that descended on Ottawa and occupied the city's streets. French authorities said over 7,000 officers have been deployed in an attempt to stop the same happening in Paris, where the protest was banned. Cars and vehicles from across the country started to descend on the city around 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, many having holed up overnight on the outskirts. Authorities have towed some vehicles away and impounded them, and there were reports of over 100 arrests. Anti-Covid protesters were joined by France's Yellow Jackets in wider discontent with the administration of President Emmanuel Macron. In the Netherlands, a similarly inspired protest took place in The Hague, where truckers and sympathisers blocked access to Parliament buildings. The Ontario Superior Court ordered protesters at the Ambassador Bridge over the US-Canadian border to end the blockade that started on Monday. The injunction came into effect at 7pm local time on Friday. After speaking to Joe Biden, Justin Trudeau, criticised by his opposition parties for his lack of action, issued a stern warning. I want to make something very clear. The illegal blockades seeking to take our neighbourhoods and our economy hostage and the collective COVID fatigue we are facing are two very separate things. If you joined the protests because you're tired of COVID, you now need to understand that you are breaking laws. The consequences are becoming more and more severe. It is not clear if law enforcement officers will be sent in to remove the truckers that protest against COVID-19 restrictions. The demonstrations have disrupted the flow of goods between the US and Canada and forced the auto industry on both sides to roll back production. On Friday, the Premier of Ontario, the province where the Ambassador Bridge is located, and the federal capital of Ottawa also declared a state of emergency. The acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic could end this year. That's according to the Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus. But this outcome would only be possible if 70% of the world's population is vaccinated by mid-year, he says. Gibriasis made this comment whilst on a working visit to Cape Town in South Africa, where the WHO has appointed a hub to produce mRNA COVID-19 vaccines to make them more available to the African continent. But as 84% of the African population is yet to receive a single dose of the vaccine, countries across Europe are starting to gradually ease restrictions. From next week in Belgium, for example, children under the age of 12 will now no longer be required to wear masks inside or out, and working from home will not be compulsory. 
Italy has followed suit, lifting rules on wearing masks outside for all adults. The three-day One Ocean Summit is now over, but the UN-supported event in Brest, France, ended with some ambitious pledges. One such breakthrough was the announcement of the launch of a coalition of some 40 countries to protect seas not under the jurisdiction of any state. The event, which was initiated by French President Emmanuel Macron, was even described by him as allowing countries to make commitments that will lead to useful actions, as well as helping to create an essential international agenda for 2022. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who announced the launch of the coalition treaty, also reminded everyone why it was important to protect the seas. This ocean is in danger. Pollution, chemicals, plastic waste, overexploitation. However, the announcement of the treaty to protect the ocean hasn't convinced all NGOs and activists, as some think actions speak louder than words. That's a step in the right direction. Um, but once again, what we want is to see if these words we translate to action in one month um, in New York uh, at the UN negotiations. But we are hoping it will do. Another important commitment made at the One Ocean Summit was a pledge by 14 nations to strengthen the fight against illegal fishing. The event in Brest was also expected to help prepare the upcoming UN Ocean Conference in June. Spanish authorities have slaughtered more than 130,000 hens after an outbreak of bird flu was detected in an intensive mega farm in Iscar in the northern region of Castilla y León. An isolation area of 10 kilometers around the farm has been put in place, but local authorities say there is very little or no risk for humans. The virus is often transmitted by wild migratory birds to domestic animals. Parents, teachers and residents rejected Tennessee's school board's decision to remove a Pulitzer Prize-winning book about the Holocaust from school curriculum. Last month, the graphic novel Mouse, in which Jews are portrayed as mice and Nazis as cats, was banned by the board in the US because of inappropriate parts for children. Its author, Art Spiegelman, said it's disturbing history, it's a profoundly uncomfortable subject to learn about, and that's the point. After two years of break because of COVID-19, the Nice Carnival has resumed. For two weeks, around 85,000 people are expected on the French Riviera. Following a limited 2020 edition and a blank year in 2021, the event, which is celebrating its 149th anniversary, found a delighted audience at its opening ceremony. It's a party here. The people of Nice, the people of the French Riviera and all the tourists have been patiently waiting for this for two years. It's a real reunion carnival. It's such a pleasure, the joy of living. We forget about COVID, we forget about everything. We are here and we're enjoying it. We love our life and it's awesome. This carnival, whose first edition took place back in 1873, is one of the most important in the world, along with the ones in Rio de Janeiro and Venice. The event, which has King of the Animals, as this year's team will be running until the 27th of February. Do women have to be naked to get into a museum? This display at the Arken Museum of Modern Art in Denmark really sets the tone for its latest exhibition. Women and Change explores what it means to be a woman today, with examples of art from the past 150 years. And it was opened by one of Denmark's most important female figures, Queen Margrethe II. In recent years, so many uh, women artists are being sort of rediscovered, pulled back into the spotlight, thankfully, and exhibited all over the world. And it's only the beginning, I think. Some of these rediscoveries are surprising, like this royal portrait from the beginning of the 20th century. But there are also many contemporary pieces. In total, the exhibition includes almost 120 works by Danish and international artists. However, if you pop into the museum bookshop, you might notice a near total absence of women in art editions. We just took a book out and we started counting. And then we realized that out of a hundred books, and they're all monographs, so every book is of one artist, there were only five women. Mm. Only books of five, five women out of hundred. It's difficult for people to just mention 10, 10 women artists. Mm. And why are there not household uh, names like Picasso or, um, and Andy Warhol and all of these? And, and it's simply because when these canons are made, then they are left out. 
Women and Change is a unique opportunity to see a wide range of female creativity, which goes way beyond gender and convention. The exhibition runs until August 14. Heather Donald, Euronews.